very successful negotiations. I don't know exactly what Mike did to persuade the Austrians to relent, but relent they did. Carrying the fruits of victory in his briefcase, Mike set out to return from Vienna to Washington, uh, to Bethesda, Maryland, a uh, suburb of D.C., where his wife Stephanie, his seven-year-old daughter Sarah, his three-and-a-half-year-old son Joey were waiting for him to celebrate Hanukkah. Mike got to Heathrow Airport, London, and realized that he could get home to Stephanie, Sarah, and Joey a couple of hours earlier if he switched flights. So he switched from a Lufthansa flight to Pan American World Airways Flight 103. And he died with 269 other people on that plane and on the ground at Lockerbie, Scotland on that horrible day in December of 1988. But we carry on his work. And when we deported Josias Kumpf to Austria just this year, uh, that was Mike's work that made it possible. Real quickly, because I know we're running out of time and I want to answer some questions, we are also responsible for barring Nazi criminals from entering the United States. And although that rarely occupies our time now, for many, many years it did. Uh, and we've stopped all manner of, of perpetrators from coming to this country. They, we put their names on the Border Control watch list. Most of those 70,000 names that we gathered that I mentioned, they're on the watch list. And we used to get, my wife will tell you, we used to get calls late at night, and especially on weekends, that so-and-so has, has, uh, has appeared here at Kennedy Airport or, or, or wherever, uh, and what do you know about them? Uh, and we would have to make a decision then and there. Um, we are, we've also been responsible in my office for what we call special projects, the first of which was um, uh, in the early 80s, we uh, investigated allegations that Klaus Barbie, the notorious Gest Gestapo chief of Lyon, France, had been aided in escaping justice and making his way to Bolivia, aided by U.S. Army counterintelligence. We proved that that was so. We documented it. We persuaded the then Reagan administration to make our entire report to declassify it and make it public. We then undertook a more comprehensive in investigation of Army CIC utilization of Nazis. Uh, that report, too, was declassified, made public. You can read all of our reports on OSI's website in full. We then were the US, principal U.S. component of the joint German-Israeli-American effort to trace the fate of uh, the infamous Auschwitz selector and experimenter Dr. Josef Mengele. As was said on the clip, um, uh, the uh, evidentiary trail, which could have been followed many years earlier by uh, German authorities, they would have found him alive. Uh, the trail led to a shallow grave in Imbu, Brazil. Uh, from which uh, remains were unearthed that were eventually identified as Dr. Mengele's. Uh, we didn't make our report public for many years because our Israeli colleagues wanted us to do a DNA uh, comparison. Uh, DNA uh, science was still in its infancy back in the mid-80s, uh, and the question was, you know, could we get a DNA sample, and what the heck would we compare it with? Uh, a, a, a sample of, from the remains was uh, put on, slide, on a slide and shipped by the Brazilian authorities to me. And it sat in my desk drawer for a couple of days uh, while we waited for the FBI to come over and pick it up. Um, to this day, my secretaries won't, won't go into my drawers. Um, and um, uh, I actually thought it was a wonderful posthumous humiliation of Joseph Mengele. I only hope that in the decidedly warmer climate in which he now finds himself, <laughs> that uh, he had some appreciation for the fact that a part of him was sitting in some Jewish uh, U.S. official's office in, in downtown Washington. But uh, we did the DNA uh, uh, examination. We got a, a very um, uh, low-level but usable sample. And then the question was, what were we going to compare it with? We had no DNA sample of Joseph Mengele. But his widow, Irena, and his son, Ralph, were still alive in Germany. If we could get uh, DNA from them, we could do a paternity test to see if Ralph was the biological offspring of Joseph and Irena. By the way, we had one fear, which was that perhaps while Joseph was off at Auschwitz, Irena wasn't, shall we say, completely faithful. But um, in the end, we, we, we did get a, a, a match, and uh, the uh, examination, the investigation was completed. Again, our report is on our website. Um, special projects, we were the principal U.S. component uh, doing the investigative work that supported the federal government's effort to help trace the fate of gold and artworks and, and other valuables that were looted by the Nazis. You know, while they were committing mass murder, they were also perpetrating the greatest theft in world history. Uh, we worked for uh, Stuart Eisenstadt on that when he was uh, under Secretary of State and then under Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, it was the historians in my office who proved what had been alleged for 50 years but never proved before, which is that gold, some of it ripped from the mouths of victims in the camps, 
was melted down by the German Central Bank, the Reichsbank, uh, and melted into, uh, smelted into gold bars and then traded with the Swiss National Bank uh, in exchange for Swiss francs, a hard currency that uh, the German government could use to buy uh, military material and other things that, that they needed. And uh, our work actually resulted in the first uh, new, shall we say, compensation of survivors that, to come out of that uh, uh, newfound interest in, in the fate of their property. I should add that um, uh, as we read all the press about artworks that were stolen from Jews and that were hanging in museums and galleries in Europe, I thought, gee, the way artworks travel in international commerce, some of that must be here. And so I, I uh, launched an investigation of the principal federal collection of artwork at the National Gallery of Art, uh, a building uh, uh, to which I'm perhaps still not welcome. but. Um, the, um, uh, we very quietly went in there and looked at their collection, went online, they didn't know what we were doing, and we settled on four works that we had identified based on a comparison uh, with uh, a post-war uh, U.S. intelligence report on missing artworks, four works that were of questionable provenance, one of which was Still Life with Fruit and Game by the 17th century Fr uh, Flemish artist Franz Snyder. Very valuable piece of art. Well, we decided to do what we thought was the right thing. We would go to the National Gallery, give them the results of our investigation, and say, now it's for you to determine whether you rightly hold this, these, these works or, and other works or, or not. We, we have confidence in you. We gave them everything. They were very grateful. One morning, uh, at least a year later, uh, I wake up, and in my bathrobe, I trudge down the driveway, pick up the Washington Post, only to see a front page story about how the National Gallery, on its own initiative, decided to look into its holdings and settled on one artwork that they identified, Still Life with Fruit and Game by Franz Schneider, as having been looted, and that they were re returning this artwork to the uh, Stern family in France from which it had been taken. And they got a lot of great press on that. Uh, the, the truth, by the way, actually, is that a representative of the Stern family had seen the artwork on their website after we notified the National Gallery, and it was after they heard from the family that they finally uh, gave it over. Um, the, the last uh, special project, uh, for eight years, uh, we, uh, I represented the, uh, a succession of attorneys general uh, in an effort to uh, identify, declassify, and disclose to the public at the National Archives in Washington uh, all documents uh, uh, that were classified uh, by the U.S. government that related to Nazi crimes and their perpetrators. None of us could have imagined that we would actually find millions upon millions of, of pages, and that in those pages uh, would be uh, a lot of extremely important historical information. To give one uh, example, uh, we found that there were British intercepts in there that were shared uh, with the uh, Office of Strategic Services, a U.S. Uh, the, the precursor of the CIA in the United States. And uh, from that, we, we learned that the British authorities, and maybe the Americans, knew well in advance of the German operation to deport the Jews of Rome, Italy's capital city. Uh, thousands of Jews were there, uh, and uh, they were to be deported. Rome, uh, the Jews of Rome, constitute the oldest continuously extant Jewish community in all of Europe. Cicero wrote about them in 59 BC. Uh, did the British authorities notify the Jews of Rome? No. The Jews had heard rumors in the fall of 43 that bad things were happening. They found it hard to believe. Their leaders had no evidence of that. And so the Jews were caught completely unaware on that day in October 1943 when the Germans rounded them up by the thousands and deported them to their deaths. And I think often of one case in this connection, Satinio Kahlo. Satinio Kalla was a Roman Jew who that morning was on the queue online uh, to buy uh, cigarettes, which were rationed. And as he was online, the raid started. And so he ran back to his apartment to try to save his family and, and himself. And he got there a few minutes too late, just a few minutes too late, which he knew because the beds were still warm. And Satinio Kalla's family was deported to Auschwitz, and he never saw his wife, or any of his nine children again. That's what these cases are all about. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I think in December of 2004, our mission was expanded by Congress uh, through the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. We now also have criminal jurisdiction in our modern cases. 
We have developed cases against Croatian murderers of Muslims. Uh, we are about to try a case in Wichita, Kansas against a, an alleged Rwandan genocidaire, Lazar uh, 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 Kobagaya. Uh, it's one of those only in America stories that an office that for so many years uh, handled primarily cases in which Jews predominated as victims uh, now has uh, a, a, an investigative docket in which um, the crimes mostly concern um, the murder of Muslims in, in Bosnia. But we have investigations going from Bangladesh to, to, um, to Guatemala and elsewhere in Latin America and Africa, of course. Uh, I'm often asked in the Nazi cases, and I'll close on this, you know, why bother? Uh, it's been so long. These people aren't a threat to uh, American society. They're not holding up 7-Elevens, you know. Uh, and I have a lot of responses to that. Uh, the standard ones are, you know, come on, the passage of time um, it doesn't lessen the gravity of the offense, it doesn't lessen the guilt. There's no statute of limitations on these kinds of underlying offenses. I say, wouldn't it be terribly hypocritical of the United States, which every year deports tens of thousands of people, mostly to Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America, uh, whose sole offense is they either came here without documentation or they overstayed their visas. Uh, to do that and yet give a pass to Nazi criminals? I don't think so. And then there is, of course, the standard deterrence argument, which is by um, pursuing these people, even into old age, you send a message to the would-be perpetrators of such crimes in the future that they may never be able to stop looking over their shoulder. And you know, maybe some, some person in some unit somewhere in the world will be in a position to listen to his commanding officer or not. And remember that he saw on television once a picture of John Demjanjuk at age 89 being hauled to court in Germany, and maybe he'll think twice about what his commanding officer has done. But perhaps the question is best, best answered by reference to one, one more case, and I'll close with this, and it's a New York case too. Utica, New York, Bogdan Cozy. We found Cozy when he'd already moved to Florida. Uh, he had operated a motel in Utica, and then when the tourism industry uh, went into a decline in Utica, somehow his motel burned to the ground. And the insurance money came in awfully handy in buying a, hotel in, a motel in Florida, where the tourism industry was, of course, booming. Um, Cozy had been a Ukrainian policeman, and we were able to prove in court that he had murdered a, a Jewish family named Candler and a, a little Jewish girl uh, named uh, Monica Singer. Uh, whom he executed at point-blank range uh, while the uh, Polish woman who had courageously been protecting this girl screamed at, at, at Cozy to, to spare the child. Uh, we proved he had done all this. And after the trial, someone said to me, you know, undoubtedly Cozy committed a lot more uh, killings than you were able to prove at that late date. He, by the way, didn't know about the things that Cozy did to high school girls in Utica. Uh, but it's another story. Anyway, um, he was never prosecuted for that. Uh, I said, you know, sure, you're right, and he's not a threat anymore. But think of the victims. Think of Monica Singer. Uh, in, my, in, in my faith, uh, there's this wonderful saying, which is actually also a Muslim saying, I, I now learn, uh, namely that when one saves a life, it's as though one has saved an entire world. And I think of that often in connection with Monica Singer and, and, and Fruma Kaplan. You know, what would they have done with their lives? And what would their children and their grandchildren have done? You know, if Monica Singer had survived the Nazi Holocaust, she could have made Aliyah, she could have gone to Israel, she could have come here, she could have done anything. But none of that was to be because of what this one man, Bogdan Kozy, did with his pistol. And that's the flip side, isn't it? When you just kill a person, you also destroy a life. So I like to think that what we do in our office, night and day, we do for all the Fruma Kaplans, all the Monica Singers, and their parents, and their grandparents, and the generations that never were to follow them. Uh, I can promise you, on behalf of our new Attorney General, Eric Holder, and on behalf of all of my colleagues, uh, at OSI and the head of the criminal division, Lanny Brewer, who is, by the way, a child of survivors, uh, that we will continue to leave no stone unturned in our World War II cases, in our Rwandan cases, in all of our cases, to ensure that some measure of justice is, however belatedly, obtained in these cases. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I, I apologize for going on overtime. Uh, you know, if people want to leave that, obviously they should. Um, and maybe we should just talk to people individually. I don't know, Greg, what do you want to do? Yeah, what I'd like to do is say thank you to Eli Rosenbaum. You thank you for your patience.